Hi, I'm Lynn Padato with ADAPT of Chicago Productions. Many of us don't have a disaster plan in place. While it is important for everyone to have a plan, it is especially so for those with special needs. With September being National Emergency Preparedness Month, it is a good time to consider what you would do in the case of various emergency situations. Here to talk about it is Jessica Mitchell, a Disability Integration Specialist with FEMA. Thanks for being with us, Jessica. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. Um, first, how does FEMA prepare cities such as Chicago for a disaster? Well, all disasters start at the local level. So when a disaster happens, the first people that are there are your neighbors, then your first responders like police officers and firemen. If the disaster is big enough that the local community needs additional assistance, either additional funding or additional resources, then they can request that from the county or the state. And then if the state needs additional resources, they'll request that from FEMA. So it might be funding to pay for supplies in shelters. It might be some additional um, cars or vehicles for evacuations, accessible vehicles. It might be just assistance getting information out about what people can do. So that's how it works during a disaster. And then in what we call the steady state when a disaster is not yet happening, we have a lot of preparedness grants and preparedness initiatives to help people and communities be more prepared. So we on our ready.gov website have information for people with disabilities, for service animals, for older adults. Um, on how to be best prepared for emergencies. We also do a lot of outreach and information to local communities and to states to look at their preparedness planning and make sure that they're meeting the needs of people with disabilities when they're planning for what they're going to do for an emergency and how they'll respond. Well, great. So um, you already touched on a few of the things available to people with disabilities, but what extra considerations are actually taken into the planning um, for people with disabilities. We want to make sure that anything we do we're meeting people's communication needs whether that's people with disabilities or people that just have some other type of accommodation need maybe they don't necessarily have a disability maybe it's someone whose first language is not English so in a stressful time it can be difficult getting information in a language that's not your first language so we focus on making sure people get um, accessible and usable communication about how to keep themselves and their families safe, what actions they can take to prepare, to respond to, or to recover after a disaster. We also want to make sure that anytime we set up facilities, so if we have assistance centers after a disaster where people can come to get information about the type of assistance that FEMA provides, and that they'll be accessible for people with disabilities, as well as any type of programmatic issues or accommodations that people might need. So if someone um, needs to apply for assistance through um, you know, text-based communication, or if they would be more comfortable or more able to apply through a telephone-based um, system, then we do that as well. So, a lot of what we provide for individuals is that preparedness information before a disaster and after a disaster if there's a presidentially declared declaration we can um, depending on the type of declaration provide assistance for people to repair or rebuild their homes find a place to stay while their home is being repaired um, replace critical personal property items like the car that you use to get to and from work or to and from school, um, medications, durable medical equipment, and those things that people need to be able to live their lives every day. Great, yeah, it's great to know that all that's there in the event of, a, of an emergency. Well, before an emergency happens, I mean, we know, say, uh, Yes, I'm thinking of like a hurricane, which wouldn't really affect Chicago, but you know something is coming, mm -hmm. or you're in the midst of some type of disaster or a national emergency. Um, what tools are available to get the information out to um, people with special needs, like hearing impaired, um, blind, things like that? We have a number of different resources for 
preparedness, but we also have some different things that we try to do when we're getting that emergency information out. So on our end at FEMA, we try to make sure that we put the information out there in multiple different formats. So accessible electronic documents, um, radio, newspaper, television. We certainly encourage states to have sign language interpreters with them or with the governor if he's making a press conference and things like that. Um, but there are things that individuals with disabilities can do themselves to make sure that they receive that emergency information. One is to kind of look around and just see which news outlets, you know, do captioning really well or are really good about keeping the interpreter on the screen during an emergency broadcast and know that that's where you can go for that emergency information. There are also programs like Alert Chicago, A-L-E-R-T-C-H-I-C-A-G-O, where you can go online and sign up to receive emergency alerts in the format that's most accessible for you. So you can get a text to your cell phone, you can get a call to your home phone, you can get an email with the emergency information. And I know a number of people, myself included, who have apps on their phones where you can sign up through either you know your zip code and the types of alerts you would like to receive so then you know your your phone can vibrate or ring in the middle of the night and you can know that something's going on then also there's the wireless emergency alert system that's been rolled out in the last couple of years which you may have received if you've gotten an alert an amber alert or a tornado warning you know through text message on your phone that you hadn't signed up for and that's really helpful especially for people with communication related disabilities in the past especially with tornadoes and other types of disasters where you have tornado sirens people who are deaf or hard of hearing can't hear those maybe people who are just inside their home aren't able to hear them and now wherever you go whether you're at home or at work or you're traveling for vacation you can receive these text-based alerts and be prepared for whatever's going on in that area i had one on the way driving in today did you <laughs> yeah the, the thunderstorm was coming so um mm -hmm. similar now the radios, it's yes. um, kind of touched on those. Who do the radios really benefit? Is it? So there are weather alert radios okay. that you can get. Um, you can get some basic ones in your local drug store mm -hmm. or um, super center store. You can also go to, I believe Radio Shack is really good about having weather alert radios with adaptive equipment that can oh, okay. go with them. So these are very good, especially if you're in an area that doesn't get good cell coverage. You can get these immediate emergency alerts and you can get radios that will give you a text-based readout that you can attach a strobe light to or a pillow shaker. So if someone is deaf or hard of hearing, they can still get those alerts. And you can also even get some that attach to refreshable braille displays. So someone who is deaf and blind who uses braille can get immediate access to what type of alert that is and what actions they need to take quickly to keep themselves or their families safe. That sounds really great to have because even if you're in Chicago and there's wide uh, cell phone coverage, if you're in a high rise, um, you could easily lose that access. Definitely. So it may be great, a great thing to have. Definitely. And, and are, sometimes are they battery powered too in case? Yes. yes. So okay. most of them, it, if they have a plug-in, they'll mm -hmm. typically also have backup battery okay. power. Some are even hand crank. So oh. if you lose power and you don't have backup batteries, mm -hmm. you might still be able to okay. get the, the alerts and the information. Okay. And probably a good thing to have for everyone, even Definitely. if you're not. Yeah. So, um, wow. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome to know what's available. Um, well, let's go through the specifics of preparing for an emergency. Um, the first is to be informed. Can you elaborate? Mm -hmm. We encourage people just to know what types of emergencies are most likely to happen where you are or where you travel. So in Chicago, you mentioned we're not going to deal with too many hurricanes, right. but we do have a lot of power outages due to severe storms, 
due to winter weather, people that might not be able to leave their house for maybe a day or a couple of days, especially in the winter when that weather is really bad. We have a lot of flooding, especially around the suburbs as well. So knowing what's most likely to happen in your community and what types of actions to take to prepare yourself for that. So if I'm someone who uses some type of adaptive equipment and it requires electricity, I would want to make sure that I'm prepared for those power outages that can happen with these summer storms and with the winter storms so that I can continue to communicate or maintain my health or, or whatever's going on while that disaster happens. And it's also important to know um, if you're going to be visiting somewhere. So if you're going on vacation to the beach, then you know maybe learn a little bit about what you do during a hurricane or what you would do if there was a tsunami warning or something of that nature. Okay. Uh, the second is to make a communication plan. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? You want to be able to not only communicate with friends or family members to let them know that you're okay or to make sure that they're okay. So a lot of times when emergencies happen, we're not all just sitting around at our house all day. We might have kids in school, we might be at work, we might be at a friend's house, we might be traveling to work. So you need to have a way to get a hold of the people that you need to get a hold of. So that might include having um, backup cell phone chargers, maybe one at work, one in your car that you could use to charge your phone, say if you were stuck on Lakeshore Drive in a snowstorm. Um, it could include you know, sending text messages to people inside and outside of the affected area. Sometimes cell signals get really jammed during an emergency. A text message is more likely to go through, so understanding things like that. It can also mean for someone with a communications related disability, maybe it's communicating with first responders or letting someone know that you need help and what type of help you need. So it might be, um, if you have a communication disability, it might be something like a printed out card that says, I'm deaf and I need an American Sign Language interpreter, or I communicate using a communications board. And if you use something like that, having a low tech backup as well. So not only having those extra batteries, but maybe having a printed out laminated board or just a printed out board of symbols that you can point to that would be helpful in an emergency. So I'm hurt or I need a doctor or my house is flooded and you can find some of those online as well. Yeah, no, that's great to know because um, I never would have thought of that. So you're talking, so even if you have an augmentative Communi communication device um, in case that goes out. Say you're without power and you can't charge it, having the PEX system, just something mm -hmm. really simple that you revert back to. Exactly. Okay. And the same thing would be true for any type of device that you use that requires power or electricity, or even if you use a service animal like a guide dog, maybe having a white cane in your emergency kit in case the animal is hurt or scared during a disaster so that you have something to fall back on. Hmm. Great things to know. Um, third, to build an emergency kit. You mm -hmm. spoke about some of it, obviously extra batteries, but what else should people include in this kit and how should they approach uh, assembling the items they might need in the event of, event of an emergency? Sure, so we recommend that people have um, an emergency kit that has, and we actually have a little brochure here that talks about some of the basic things you would want in your emergency supply kit. So it mentions water is especially important for yourself and your family, as well as if you have pets and service animals, food, um, kind of first aid and personal hygiene stuff as well as anything that you might need to be able to communicate or to get around in your home or your community. So you might have some non-perishable foods, some canned foods with a can opener, um, some bottled water for yourself and your family, and um, a first aid kit. And you might also have some of those things that I mentioned earlier, like a backup white cane. It's really, um, not something that has to be really expensive to put together and not something that you necessarily have to put together all at once. So a good way to do this is say, 
um, you go to get new glasses or contacts. If you keep the old pair, maybe in your emergency kit, and then if something happens to your new pair during the emergency or they get lost, you'll have that old pair that you could use. So anytime that you get new equipment, if you're able to keep the older equipment in case of an emergency, that can be very helpful. It can also be something where you can go and next time you go to the grocery store just buy one or two extra cans of vegetables or food and build up your emergency kit that way so you don't have to spend a lot of money or do it all at once. The dollar store is a great place to find flashlights and other things for your emergency kit. Um, and just think about the things that you use every day to be able to stay healthy and stay independent in your home and community and communicate with others. And it's a good place to start. Well, and um, medication. So mm -hmm. how do you prepare for disaster? Um, for medic Are there steps and advice? Yes. For people? So Lots of people take prescription medication. Mm -hmm. I think the statistics I saw were 80% of adults in the U.S. take some type of prescription medication. And we understand that it can be difficult to get extra medication for a lot of, a lot of medications. So what we recommend and what people have told me that they do is carry a pill bottle with them with a week's worth of medication that they refill every day as they take it. So if I'm at work and something happens at work and I have to go immediately to a shelter or to evacuate, I'll have a couple of days of medication with me. So if you're getting towards the end of the month, maybe that is not as helpful, but at least you would have one or two days so that you would have a little bit of a, a buffer there. It also helps to know what medications you're taking. Then if you have to go to a shelter or if you have to evacuate and try to replace those, that makes it a lot easier. So keep a list basically mm -hmm. on you, which you is smart. Once with again, for anyone, out. if you're yeah. on a lot of, you're elderly, you're on a lot of medications, you should have that list with you. Definitely. And you, um, you can do something like put it print it out and put it in a plastic baggie mm -hmm. in your emergency kit so it doesn't get wet. Or you can put it on a flash drive or something like that and put oh. that in a plastic baggie in your emergency kit. Along with you know who your doctor is, if you have animals, who your preferred veterinarian is in case your animal needs some emergency care after a disaster, that type of information, who are your important contacts things like that. And all these helpful tips are available online. Yes. What's the address where? So if you go to www.ready.gov, you'll find a lot of this information. There are um, different brochures. So there's the emergency supply list that I mentioned earlier. There's a preparedness brochure specifically for people with disabilities, specifically for older adults, pets and service animals. So there's a lot of information there that you can either look at online or download and print off. And you can also request bulk brochures. So if you have some type of event coming up and you want to share the information, you can get those for free to be able to give out to at your event or to your community. Yeah, no, great, great, great. Well, um, finally, post-disaster, you know, people need their money and mm -hmm. so I understand that there's a way that you can register in order to ensure um, receipt of your disability benefits and any other sources of income. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well I would recommend that if people can to have their their funds direct transferred to their bank accounts so that you're not worried about losing you know a physical check or something mm -hmm. like that after a disaster. Um, it's also important to just think about the fact that power might be down, computer systems might be down. So having some cash in your emergency kit can be very helpful as well to buy those immediate necessities if the cash registers and credit card machines aren't working after a disaster. So having a little bit of that left over, as well as having copies of some of your important identification documents like your state ID or your driver's license, um, so that if you have to reapply for benefits after a disaster, you'll have those ready to go and have those in your emergency kit and you know a baggie or some other mm -hmm. type of watertight. Or even a lockbox. Mm -hmm. Like I have a 
go you know, to go lockbox if there's ever a fire. All the important important documents mm -hmm. are right in there, so you just grab it and. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah don't worry about your purses or mm -hmm. I don't know anything. You know the crazy pictures. People do that, but you really need mm -hmm. your documents so that you can recreate your life when it's over. So definitely. Um, so any other last uh, thoughts or anything else you want to get out to our audience? Sure. Um, I appreciate being involved in this. I think it's something that's very important for people to be prepared for emergencies. The more prepared we are as individuals and the more prepared um, the officials who are working on emergencies are to meet the needs of people with disabilities, the fewer people are going to be you know, seriously harmed by disasters. So I think it's a very important issue. I would also like to mention that um, ready.illinois.gov, and that's Illinois spelled out, has emergency preparedness videos on a lot of different topics, and they're in American Sign Language. So you can go there for some great information in sign language as well. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, thank you for all the practical tips and uh, sure. tools that will hopef hopefully help someone in the event of, of a disaster or an emergency. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. For and me. thank you for joining us. It's uh, Lynn Padato with Adaptive Chicago Productions. Have a great one.